You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. <laughs> Nationalist News. Highlights of the news today, Monday the 13th of August. School governor resigns over sex education video. Illegal Gambian rapist to serve sentence in our prison. Job centre calls staff strike today. France hauls Romas in, too little, too late. Iranian death toll rises. Egypt's Morsi orders retirement. Thought for the day, Britain's Got Talent rehatched forever, forever. And finally, a bear with a sore head. UK News. The Living and Growing DVD has caused uproar around the UK for its graphic sex scenes, one of which shows a naked man chasing his partner round a room waving a feather. In fact, so much so that one of the governors of Westbury Lee Primary School in Wiltshire has resigned. Although the DVD has been withdrawn, Westbury Lee bought it before that and is still showing it to its five-year-old pupils. It received strong criticism from parents and even a government minister, Neil Gibbs, said that the Channel 4 produced DVD should be withdrawn. Governor Keith Miller, 75, said he's not against sex education in schools but that this was too much too soon. He had been a governor at that school for 12 years. A World to Date reporter commented, it is just the sort of Marxist diversity-ridden propaganda that Channel 4 dishes out for our youngsters. Five years old is far too young to be knowledgeable in all matters and aspects of adult sexuality, and our society is reaping the benefits of early sexualization now anyway. Apparently the use of a feather is also in a sex education book for babies called For You, and is key to some of the writings of Dr Kinsey, who gleaned much of his information from child molesters. These books are now being lauded as necessary information by the Labour leftists for our children. Joaquin Cardos, 32, an illegal immigrant and drug dealer from Gambia, West Africa, was jailed for 11 years for raping one of his customers at Knife Point in his flat in Edinburgh. He was told by the judge that his violent and persistent attack on a woman who had been convinced she was going to die. Lord Hardy said that the offence on the 26-year-old victim, a marketing executive, had been devastating and she was undergoing psychological therapy. Detective Sergeant Mark Petrie, who led the investigation, said, I would like to thank the victim for her bravery in coming forward. I sincerely hope she can continue to rebuild her life and put this ordeal behind her. The woman giving evidence said she needed cannabis to help her sleep and that she had been put in touch with Booba and regularly bought £20 bags of cannabis from him. A World Date writer comments, It just shows how one illegal African can apparently obtain a flat in a town plus set up a drugs business without any problems. There is something seriously wrong with our diverse society. Thousands of job centre staff will go on strike on Monday in a long-running row over oppressive working conditions and unrealistic targets. More than 6,000 members of the Public and Commercial Services Union in 32 call centres throughout the UK will walk out in a repeat of action first taken last year. More to the point, one unemployed Briton told a World Date reporter today, boot out all the migrants we see hanging around the city off licences and that should help your job. Euronews. Even the French socialist government has reached breaking point with the illegal Roma gypsies. French police in riot gear descended on a settlement near Lille shortly after dawn to oversee the evacuation of some 200 Roma living in mobile homes. In another instant, 100 people were evicted from a site in Lyon, with similar roundups happening in other major cities, including Marseille. Caravans and huts were destroyed in the Belleville area of central Paris on Wednesday, making another 100 people homeless. Many of those evicted will be flown home to Romania, said an interior ministry source, who insisted the deportations were aimed at ridding France of illegal communities. Previous President Nicolas Sarkozy formulated this strategy and was always seen pandering to the right, but the leftist government now realises that these measures are necessary. A World Date reporter commented, The pictures shown in the newspapers were all from Sarkozy's first muster against the Romas in 2010. But Manuel Valls, the new interior minister, said that the pregnant women would be rehoused as quickly as possible, which rather defeats the object of deporting some, doesn't it? World News From Tehran, Monday saw a rise in the death toll from the twin earthquakes on Saturday to 306. The search was called off yesterday for survivors. 
Health Minister Marzia Vahid Dasjerji told Parliament today that the number jumped to about 50 after some victims expired in hospital. More than 3,000 people were injured in the earthquakes, which hit the towns of Aha, Haris and Vakwazan in East Azerbaijan province. At least 12 villages were totally levelled and 425 others sustained damage ranging from 50 to 80%. Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi orders Defence Minister Field Marshal Hussein Tantawi's retirement. Tantawi is also Chief of Staff, and Morsi has made the strongest move yet to seize back the powers the military stripped from his office before he took over. However, the militants killed 16 Egyptian soldiers a week ago at a border post with Israel in Sinai, and he has taken advantage of that situation to assert his authority. Thought for the day, the finals of the Olympics, really? Well, here I am again during yet another U-turn on the Games. The one thing that we can be sure of is that I will not be commenting on any Games we may have in the UK in the years to come. Well, I recorded all the ceremony, but watched a small amount until I could watch no more. Now, allowing for the fact that I'm a person of mature years, and also allowing for the fact that I simply cannot stand any form of disorganised, diversity-ridden, patriotic shambles, this so-called plunge into the depths of the socialist leviathan was revolting. On first sight, it looked like an old top of the pops, with a stream of over-the-hill ex-performers running around with very expensive props and not much else. For the guys amongst the audience everywhere, there was enough tit and arse to satisfy even the most prolifically sexually orientated guy, but nothing for us girls. You cannot count Russell Brand as a sexual object because he not only looks dirty and rough, but sounds awful as well. In fact, all of the so-called artists I saw were a Marxist delight. The trouble was they were all over the hill. Poor old Annie Lennox, who I've always admired, could barely stand and her voice was not clear at all. Fat boy Slim looked like an old mummy in his obviously very expensive plastic octopus, which actually had more sex appeal than him. I couldn't get the relevance of the over-the-hill and drug-ridden Kate Moss and the troop of models wobbling around the arena that was supposed to relive the good old days of Carnaby Street. Of course, the diversity-ridden scene could not be British without the inevitable rappers and street dancers. The main trouble with these scenes was that they looked generally unrehearsed and were not in any particular order. In the words of Simon Cowell on one of his applicants to Britain Has Talent, there was too much going on at one time and no one knew what to look at first. And in fact, the closing of the games bore an uncanny resemblance to that show with all its tawdry and facile stops pulled out. It was a Marxist socialist delight. It must have cost the British people a bomb. Even ageing artists require money, and being boil inspired they probably got it. The one main difference between the communist Chinese doing something nationalistic and socialist is that it was just that. All Chinese people, all regimented, and all a pleasure to watch. I'm not a supporter of the communist Chinese regime at all. In fact, I'm a fervent opposer of any form of communism. But you have to hand it to them. They presented a good, watchable show, not gimmicky, not sentimental, and not a mess, which ours was all along the line. The headlines in the mail were out with a bang, and yup, as ever, even Boyle cannot bleep up fireworks. The Spice Girls, oh dear, and what other relics do they bring out of mothballs? Ghosts of Mercury and Lennon, pet shop boys in bizarre hats, girls on a beach, Kaiser Chiefs as mods complete with scooters, even Darcy Bustle swinging on high as a phoenix. What on earth was a phoenix doing in these celebrations? The last thing we need in our effort at the Olympics being rehatched forever and ever and ever. Now, gold winners notwithstanding, for who I have the greatest admiration, good old Team GB, but it has to be said that the host country usually wins more because they're on home territory. But why did this closing ceremony resemble an out-of-date pop concert? Are we as Britons defined in the Marxist world as just that? a second-rate but very expensive show of old pop artists. Although we must not forget Churchill, or rather Timothy Spall, popping out of Big Ben or the Elizabeth Tower, of course. I would say without fear of contradiction that most, if not all, the so-called stars veered to the left of politics and that they resembled an ill-assorted bunch of Unite Against Fascism supporters, complete with their mentor Cameron and Boris there as well. And we might have had a march past of the troops for the Kremlin in the days of old just to help out. One article on the closing down made me rather queasy was written by Jasmine Alibi Brown as Melanie Phillips was away, but not with Ramadan like most of our TV news reporters and presenters. Lovely. The only time TV is English is during sodding Ramadan. I diverse. I mean, I digress, my friends.
In this article, Brown is of course sending an accolade to the diversity of the Olympics. As she quotes, black and Asian Britons are for the first time feeling that promise of tolerance and integration are coming true. Ugh. I'm wondering if this blissful tolerance and integration are coming together anywhere outside this country in the Games. Areas like Nigeria, where the Muslims are killing Christians. Somalia, where the Islamic government is systematically starving the non-Muslim African population. Yes, even in our country, where the onus seems to be on us, the indigenous British, to actually want integration with what? She, of course, goes on in this stomach-churning sense that I see as yet another Muslim takeover of a Western ideal. From the Palestinian girls running in masks and being cheered on in our press, to Mo Farah now being lauded with the British flag on his shoulders. Good for him. As a devout Muslim to run for a country that is not yet Muslim is great, as indeed Allah apparently is. Apparently, he extols the virtue of this country. Good as it is, probably the only country in the world where we take anybody in, and I mean anybody and everybody. Some days ago, Brown was trawling the London underground and did not have far to go to find a Muslim Somali family. In London, never not our fair city. Or rather a mother and a stream of sons and a daughter, all wearing various bits of the Union flag, under and about hijabs, niqabs or whatever. This apparently signifies a great step forward and an historical watershed. Yes, it does. It marks the end of Britain as we know it, and the end of the Olympics as far as I'm concerned. Our Muslim writers and powerhouses are taking over everything, and I mean everything. I'm surprised there was not a bloody mosque in the opening and closing ceremonies, actually. Now, Brown is one of the thousands of Ugandan Asians who came to enrich us and grace our shores, and I, for one, am not grateful. I wish they'd all gone to Pakistan or wherever. I do not care for diversity. I do not care whether these people are accepted or not. They're just too many of them, and let's face it, a little of a Muslim Asian goes a hell of a long way. Throughout this missive on how well we Brits have behaved towards Muslims, she cites a couple of footballers of African descent. Well, that to you and me means black as the ace of spades, and apparently they prefer soft-touch Britain as well, as they now play for Tottenham. Brown finishes by saying that the games showed the diversity of Britain in the very best light, yada, yada, and more yada. In fact, although never pro-Nazi, I do feel a Nuremberg rally coming on here, which was the one thing missing from both the game ceremonies, order and discipline. The singers, dancers and flyers all showed absolutely none of this. They were cavorting along as if they were on drugs, which a great many probably were, and were knocked into second place by the non-human props, which were obviously very pricey. Even Brand's bus looked good, but words failed me when an entourage of Bentleys heralded Jesse J or someone who looked like her. In fact, the competitors probably could have put on a better show, and I'm including the Paralympics there as well. Uber leftist Danny Boyle should be shot for misappropriating public funds and paying a bunch of over-the-hill past celebrities, and I'm not including the dead ones here, on show any money at all. There should be a public inquiry as to exactly where all the millions of pounds have gone, when in all truth we could have just flown the red flag over a large mosque and left it at that. I'm not slamming Britain or the British. I'm slamming the liberal left and the sway it holds over our people. From a frankly shoddy Olympic ceremony to the leftist indoctrination of our schools and a Marxist reality TV which shines over the six-packs and ignorance of the masses. I should think the world is laughing at us now despite the medals. The Brits shine at many things. Diversity is not one of them. Our people should all wake up and learn a valuable lesson from the past weeks. Be true unto yourself being one of them. Good luck, Rio. At least you can get your poor out of the favelas for your games. At least they have some style, as your carnival shows. Our Notting Hill effort just shows how badly we Brits fare in the diversity stakes, but are still trying and trying and trying and trying and trying and trying. And finally, a bear with a sore head. A family of bears broke into a holiday cabin in Norway and drank a hundred cans of beer. The owner of the cabin, Evan Borton Nielsen, returned home with his family to find dozens of empty beer cans and the home completely trashed. They had a hell of a party in there, he said. The entire cabin was destroyed. The beds and all kitchen appliances, stove, oven and cupboards and shelves were all smashed to pieces. The bears got into the cabin through a window. They then apparently proceed to drink all the family's beer supply, eat all the food in the kitchen, including chocolate, honey and jam, and then smash up the furniture. 
This presenter says it's almost Goldilocks and the three bears, bless them. They all need bear as bows, don't they? <laughs> you have been listening to The World at Eight. I'm Lynn Mozart, and I wish you all a very good night. <laughs>